Uh oh. <laughs> Mind your manners. We're mic'd. Let's call this uh, meeting of the Eldon County Board of Education to order. It is November 22nd, 2021, and we are at the Arvin Education Center. First item of business, Superintendent, is to approve the agenda, sir. Any corrections or additions? Yes, I'd like to uh, recommend that the, uh, uh, the make the recommendation for action item uh, J consider approval of to report for FY21 that we remove that from action item uh, consideration for tonight's agenda just to, just so our board can have discussion. Thank you, sir. You guys got that? All right. So now may I have a motion to approve the agenda? Made by Ms. Hundley, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor? That's 5-0. Thank you. Before we do any Thing further in honor of the um, death of our North Oldham High School student who was only 16 years old I'm going to ask everybody just to remember her and her family and honor them with a moment of silence please Ms. Cassidy, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Superintendent, we are ready for the treasurer's report, sir. Yes, I'd like to invite Ms. Anderson to come forward and give the treasurer's report. Good afternoon, Ms. Anderson. The sun is shining. All right, we begin on page one. This is the treasurer's report for the month of October, and we begin with the uh, cash. We have governmental cash uh, at uh, beginning balance at thirty million five seventy nine, and ending balance of thirty four seven thirty six. Um, total cash beginning balance thirty six million three hundred fifty eight thousand, and ending uh, almost forty one million. In the next section, we have our bonded construction funds. The only activity we see there is a little bit of interest, and we're hoping to increase that um, with your approval of, of uh, one of our recommendations for investment with Stockyards Bank. On the following page, you can see the governmental cash by the individual funds. And on the page after that, we have the historical comparisons of uh, selected accounts. My focus at this time is going to be on revenue. If we look at uh, the revenue selected accounts, general property tax, we've got very small. For property tax, November will be our big month. So we, we are on track so far. Uh, on the next item, the PSC property and franchise tax, we are catching up from a sl slow prior year. The following uh, item, delinquent property tax, is comparable to prior year. And as we had expected, it is a little bit higher than it has been in prior years, just due to COVID. Uh, the next item, motor vehicle tax, we have a slight increase over the prior year. And these three items, motor vehicle utilities and SEEK program, are uh, right where we're expecting them at this point in the year. You can see with the SEEK, we're up 300000 over the prior year. And that is primarily due to the kindergarten um, uh, full-day funding that we received this year. The two uh, following items, capital outlay and building fund revenues, are where we expect them to be at this point in the year. 
On the following page, on page four, are the uh, each of the revenue accounts, uh, again, uh, with a historical comparison to the prior three years. As we go to page six, you can see our salaries um, and benefits. Uh, I wanted to point out a couple things in this area. We do have uh, an increase in the classified overtime salary. This is primarily for the transportation department who's doing an excellent job helping with the bus driving. They, they're really putting in some long hours to make that happen. Uh, the next section in employee benefits, you can see uh, the CERS, Employer Contribution, account 0232. Uh, we continue to see tremendous increases over the prior years. Um, we're up um, $200,000 over where we were a few years ago. Let's see, if we turn the page, uh, I wanted to let you know under professional technical services that 0347, uh, security services is zero, but that is only because uh, we are moving these costs over to the grant, the um, state grant to pay for that. So we will eventually see some expenses in that account as well. If we move to page nine, there were a couple items I wanted to bring your attention to here. Um, the insurance accounts at the top of the page, it's kind of taken them a, a while to catch up with where we were in the previous years, but you can see um, we're seeing some significant increases uh, in those areas as well. Uh, a nice offset to that is a little uh, a bit below that on the online network, 0533, uh, we are seeing considerable decreases in the cost for our um, internet. Mm -hmm. And that is thanks to Trey. Yes. In the next section on page 12, I wanted to bring a, your attention to a couple items. Uh, we've got two large items in here, $52,000 under machinery, and this is primarily a garbage compactor for LaGrange. And below that, we've got $67,000, and that was for the 911 phone system, uh, a portion of the payment for the 911 phone system that you all approved at the end of last year. So as we look at the final page of this report, and you can see our grand total of expenses are $22,621,000, and we are up $600,000 over the prior year, and that is a 3% increase. And I would anticipate that inflation will be impacting this a little further as we go down the year. On the following report, uh, we have uh, the functional expenses, and I wanted to call your attention to really just this first line for instruction. You can see that our costs are down. We're at $9.9 .9 million this year. Last year we were at 10.2. Uh, that's $300,000 reduction. And at the time that I looked at this, we had 55 open positions. So that's, that's a lot of positions. On page 18, we have the summary of bonding potential. There's no change there following page we have the balance sheets and those are by fund and if you go to page 33 we have the income statements by fund and that concludes the treasurer's report yes questions or comments miss Hundley um, Stephanie can you when you talked about security services and it was at zero from a grant is that from what grant is it's what's, a, what's included state, in that the flex the flex funding where we get uh, we used to get PD and uh, textbooks, and now it's just preschool safety, and uh, I think it's Gates. We get three. So the state gives us an amount, so we put our SROs in safety and security, and then as we accumulate those expenses, we move them out of the general fund. Okay. Thank you. That answer your question, Ms. Hundley. Yes, ma'am. Other questions or comments? All right, thank you, Ms. Anderson. May I have a motion to approve the treasurer's report, please? Made by Ms. Nykirk and seconded by Ms. Hundley. All those in favor? And that would be 5-0. Would you take us through bills and claims, please? Yes, these are the bills and claims since our um, previous end of month board meeting. And so we have uh, about 1,800 invoices and $10,650,000 that have been spent. As you look through here, you will see um, quite a few construction uh, invoices coming through. Well, you've got quite a bit for South, Oldham County High, um, some for Buckner, and you can see that East Oldham Middle is starting. 
Um, we did get the bonding on East Oldham Middle, so I'm sure that that will be increasing as time goes on. Uh, you can also see that um, North Oldham High School, we were um, picking up on these interactive classrooms that we had kind of planned a little bit more last year's, but um, it's picking up speed this year. Tell us what page you're on, Ms. Anderson. Page 91. At the Sorry. beginning. Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay, but you're speaking specifically about some of our I'm schools. I'm speaking so. in general. So okay, yeah, okay, would, excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah, the construction is scattered throughout. Um, interactive classroom is as well. Um, the other item I wanted to talk about, um, we're seeing a pickup of field trips in PD. So those have been on hold uh, because of COVID. So those costs are picking up and kids are getting to go to the pumpkin patches. And the final thing I wanted to mention on this, you may see that we have paid for a VW bus and the KISTA buses. So there was a portion that the KISTA funds didn't cover, and so we have paid that. And we also paid the VW bus. You may remember we had a, there's a settlement, and we will get reimbursed, reimbursed for a portion of that VW bus. And that concludes bills and claims. Questions or comments, board members? All right, motion to approve bills and claims, please. Made by Mr. Dodson and seconded by Mr. Kehoe. All those in favor, and that's 5-0. Thank, Thank you, Ms. You. Anderson. Board members, we have a couple of sets of um, meeting minutes to approve. The first are from our October 25th regular board meeting. Any questions, corrections, additions? Motion to approve, please. Made by Mr. Kehoe, seconded by Ms. Hundley. All those in favor? And that would be 5-0. Thank you all. And then we had a work session on November 8th. Were there any corrections, additions, subtractions? <laughs> Motion to approve, please. Made by Mr. Kehoe, seconded by Ms. Hundley. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Thank you all. Superintendent, we're ready for your um, report to the board on personnel actions, sir. Yeah, like for the board to consider uh, personnel actions as presented. Any questions or comments? All right, thank you, sir. At this time, we have consent agenda items A through H. Your um, recommendation, Superintendent? Yeah, recommend uh, approval of consent items A through H. All right, I think Mr. Kehoe has a, a comment. Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, look at the, I guess, the construction committee. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a, a fair representation of all the schools there, especially the Arts Center, and, um, and also Odom County High School and Odom County Middle. Just wondering what your all's thoughts on that are. Can we just share that with Mr. Bohannon and um, Superintendent? And um, have, ha, has our, have our committee members already accepted um, the uh, recommendation to, to uh, function on the LPC? Um, the, the call was put out to um, both in the uh, advertisement and the old mayor. Why don't you use the microphone, please, Mr. Bohannon, and let's just discuss how how persons become members of the local planning committee. Yes, ma'am. First thing we do is we put an um, advertisement in the uh, Old Mayor um, announcing that the uh, certain parts of that position that we're form formalizing the committee and certain parts of that position are open to community members, um, parents, teachers, and basically the makeup of that organization. At that point in time, uh, volunteers are... Uh, recommended and or volunteer to be a part of that. Um, after that, we put out a call to our administrators, um, our teachers, and um, other uh, central office staff to uh, fill out the remaining portions of that. And I think you've got it all before you there, but it's you know, four parents, four teachers, um, three community members, a um, planning and zoning member, and you got the rest of the breakdown there, but basically a 20 member committee. Um, all schools are, are, represent, are represented across the district. We try to do the best we can to kind of get equal representation of each you know, side of the county. Also represented from high school, elementary, middle school, um, spread, split up in that direction as well. Um, obviously with only 20 spots, not every school gets one of each. 
um, but we try to balance how many parents we have from this side of the county with some teachers from this side of the county or if we've got some high school uh, administrators involved with it like we do Fulton County High School and we try to find some elementary school um, yes. to balance that out so um, and then the superintendent and I get together and um, formalize the uh, recommendation to the board and so mr. Bohan there's uh, state requirements for membership as you just talked about and then you we got information back from those who wanted to participate and then can you talk about some of the steps you took to try to uh, continue to meet those requirements to fulfill the recommendation for the committee members yes yeah, so uh, once we've once we've not went through that portion of it after we've got the volunteers and um, if we still had a need in certain areas I reached out to administrators to uh, kind of recommend some teachers um, that they thought would be good for that position um, and then I also reached out to specific ones that we didn't have representation in um, for example uh, one of the later ones to come on board was from East. We didn't have any representation from that side of the county. So I reached out to Mr. Robson. He recommended someone to put it to uh, fill the teacher role in that. So you see that recommendation on there as well. Okay. I may have missed the Art Center. Uh, who from the... the that as I said, there's not a person from each building mm -hmm. because that would be more than 20. Okay. And the representation is 20. So not everybody has a... Not every building has a representative. But you also see on there that we're trying to have uh, we have a teacher representative from Crestwood position open that would fulfill that side of the county that portion that campus if you will um, to uh, fit into KDE's standard of how many people of this nature we need to make the whole committee could a teacher but I will go ahead and say I'm sorry Mr. Goss I don't mean to interrupt but I will go ahead a teacher and from the Arts Center fill in for the teacher from Crestwood because they're right there on the same campus I have no issue with that the answer is sure if they volunteer. And I, will also, I will also say it's a public meeting so anyone's welcome to join yes thank you for the additional information it is unusual that we would um, have a discussion on the consent agenda item but I appreciate the additional information okay. if there's anything else just let me know thank you mr. Bohannon so I'm gonna ask the superintendent if you don't have anything to add what's your recommendation here sir yeah, recommend to approve the committee membership uh, as 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 presented for the district new district facility plan. We we'll also add and echo Mr. Bohannon's uh, comments there that we can't have other uh, uh, invite others to attend and, and provide input that wouldn't be a voting member if they're outside who is on that list, but they could be able to participate. True. So we are actually approving the entire consent agenda, yes. uh, A through H. So uh, I need a motion to approve, please. Made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Ms. Nykirk. All those in favor? And that would be four with one Oops. opposed. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, Superintendent, we are ready for report number one, sir. Sure, yes. I'd like to invite Mr. Uh, Deems to come forward and, and share with the board our uh, COVID report. Welcome, Mr. Deems. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, so that's Mason's very little first. print. All right, hopefully it's a little better for you guys. I'm on that <laughs> piece of it. So what we want to do is I'm come back and continue to update with the numbers to show you trends and where we're going um, within the district since our last update. Um, so we have those numbers provide for you. Um, so the first part is um, looking at current uh, cases. There are 38 current preschool and elementary student cases, which is 0.7 percent of the entire population for preschool and elementary. There are five middle school student cases for 0.17% um, out of the 2973, and there are 16 high school cases for a 0.40% um, out of the 13, um, 3986 number for high school students. So total population, there's 59 active cases for a 0.48% out of the 12,389 students. Um, if you look at our daily average, um, of student staff cases um, going back to August up through 11.15 to 11.19. Um, we, are, we have increased a little bit from 5.8 to 9.8 cases um, over the last time we presented um, on those, on those uh, daily cases per student and staff. Do we know uh, which one of those are elementary and high of those nine? Yeah, we'll get, we'll, I'll get that okay. to you here in a second. Hang on. Give me a couple slides. Um, so just to show the bar graph um, and kind of showing where we had our, our lowest point on 11.1 to 11.15, 11.5, uh, and then up through 
um, 11, 15 to 11, 19, we're still under that 10 um, student per day case average. Um, our quarantines have gone up a little bit. Some of that's due to the quarantine requirements do change a little bit when you're masked and unmasked, but our test to stay numbers have also gone up. So families and students are still using test to stay, um, and that's still a practice that they can have to ensure that they can come and be um, in person for instruction um, if they test negative on the test to stay at the Arts Center um, daily on that piece of it. Um, so we said, you know, I think two meetings, I can't remember it was two meetings ago or last meeting, that, you know, there are five major data points we look at, along with we looked at parent survey and we looked at trend data um, from four weeks prior to the date of, on the left-hand side column, just to kind of see if there's any trends um, going from there. So uh, I think last time we met was um, on November 8th, we were at 5.19, 16.7, 2.8, 56.4, and then 87. Um, then the next full week we had was November 15th, 5.53, um, 16.5, 5.8, 56.78, 84.6. Um, and then we, we put this together um, on Friday, and so our numbers are accurate as of um, late last week, so we don't have an update for just today yet. Um, but those numbers reflect uh, the 19th, just to put that out there as well. And that's 6.17 um, for state positivity. 24.6 for OC incident rate, 9.8 that we talked about from the first slide, um, and then our vaccination rate's gone up. Um, we're actually having our first student vaccination clinic on campus at Buckner tonight, um, and had, had a good turnout for that, so we're excited about that for people who wanted opportunity um, at that point, and then our ICU capacity is back to 90.6%. And hey, Mr. Dews, uh, Buckner, and we have three other locations. Can you uh, just yeah, touch uh, on that? And so we've uh, we partnered with um, Baptist Health out of LaGrange, that are providing, um, providing four vaccination clinics um, for any student, but really we're trying to target the uh, five to 11 year old population. Um, it's open to any, any young person in the county. It's not just at the school that it's um, associated with. We tried to spread them out a little bit. Uh, there's an email that went out with um, QR codes and different things to sign up for that. Um, and tonight's just happens to be at Buckner. And I am not 100% sure where the next three are, but they're they are coming quickly in just the next week, week and a half. Mr. Dees, can you do you have an idea how many um, families have signed up for that? There's 80. There's over eight. There's 86 at Buckner today, and I'm not sure about the other three. We're, uh, total, as of as of this afternoon, we're total we're 285. And we had Thank over you. 600 staff get their boost, sign up for their booster vaccinations, and we're partnering with Ohm County um, Health Department to provide staff the, the booster if they so choose. Um, and we've done different clinics throughout the last week, week and a half for that as well. So we've had a good turnout for that um, booster clinic um, to go from there. How many additional days do we have at our school sites? Yes, yeah, so we have tomorrow uh, and then next Monday the 29th and next Tuesday the 30th. So we have three more uh, shot clinics uh, available. And then there's appointments available at Kroger, um, Walgreens, and then other uh, doctors are starting to pick it up. But the Pfizer one was the one we've been told was um, just because they got to get the refrigeration and all that worked out at some sites, they didn't do it before. So we were working through those. So there's, there's opportunity out there for students um, or families who want to pursue that. And one additional question, I'm going to open it up to the board. Um, there are some families who received their first vaccination on the 11th and could be ready for their second. Yeah, there's three weeks. Are, it, mm -hmm. Is that possible Correct. at our school sites too to get their second? I think they have to go back to the same site they got their first one. We're only off on their first shot right now. Okay. And then we have a corresponding second date already pre-scheduled for which one you signed up with us. So they'll come back and do that piece. Um, okay. And the, when we talked with Baptist Health, I can't remember, it was 76 or 78% um, rate uh, after the first shot of protection, um, working through that. So felt like in that first shot was, was a big deal for some, some families. I thought so too, Mr. Deves. We have heard from some folks who um, would like some further validation of that 76 to 78 percent. Did we hear that from our, our I hospital? Just, Mr., I know Mr. Davis worked with uh, Baptist Health on that number. I, I can't give the exact number, and he's working the clinic now. So. Yeah. Uh, but that came from them to us. All right. Uh, questions, Mr. Dodson. So, I got, and I oh. have a few more slides too. For oh, 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, do you have a question? Well, so on those shots, to get full 
immunity or whatever you want to call it it takes about what five six weeks well, I'm not an expert on that I, I know there's the first shot three weeks later is the second shot and then there's a period afterwards it's two weeks so about five uh -huh. weeks and uh, we're giving shots now so that means they wouldn't be fully immune to this or whatever you want people want to call it until sometime late December right middle to depending on when you do that yes I mean it's, saying today it would yes be. okay thank you okay. thank you okay. um, thank you mr. Deeps so um, Larry asked earlier about where is it by school can we can we pinpoint and give some more information so we went through and we wanted to put some and again this is a as of Friday I believe information so if you look at like the preschool has zero cases um, look at Centerfield and Crestwood is at two you jump to Harmony which um, has 14 which is still 2.25 percent of their population um, you look at a Lagrange um, is one so it's 0.21 percent and then one at Locust is 0.17 percent um, so the whole left the left side column is, is um, schools that are matched right now if you go to the right hand side uh, the top four um, look at East Oldham has one is 1 1.6 out of 640 OCMS um, is 0 0.28 or 2 out of 727 so you have two three you have five cases in the middle uh, middle schools and then you look at our high schools um, Buckner has zero North has one South has two and then uh, Oldham County is the highest in the county with 13 but it's only 0.79 percent of their entire population of the 1638 so we knew we'd have questions where is it by school and so we want to put that in a little bit different form to say how we're trying to also look at data um, multiple different ways with things that are changing and ever moving uh, I'd just like to also just emphasize that this data is just lagging just a little bit I mean so we could have we've had some students come off and then maybe a student added so again this is as of Friday this is excellent data for us to review school by school thank you mr. Deeves and that is what we are um, asking the superintendent the second, this afternoon yes. and our assistant superintendent attendance to monitor mr. Dodson I got another question I noticed the high schools percentage are, is lower than elementary and the reason I presume that is a lot of the high school kids are already vaccinated and what have you even though they're out of mask but the elementary aren't all vaccinated and they're wearing masks and still got a higher number uh, I, I'm concerned about the vaccination with these kids so there are multiple facets yes. and I'm not the expert on that I'm just here to present data right now <laughs> thank you thank you mr. Dodson all right all right mr. and then Dave's. Um, just to just to reiterate um, you know we're, con we're continuing to consult look at our data from as many different viewpoints I'm on that so we'll uh, review all our data with our community health partners um, with uh, Matt Rhodes and them at Ohm County Health and other community members and practitioners um, we do we review it on a daily basis um, mr. Davis and his team have just been excellent on giving that to us um, continue to have discussion with other districts and within our region that have been masked optional much longer at different pieces when have they moved in and out because some of them had to had to move back in certain instances um, with maybe a school or a class um, and then we continue just to, throughout the state what else is going on as you see different changes in this um, ever-evolving pandemic yes sir um, just some important notes too uh, we're going to continue to work with um, parents are medically fragile we've done that with high school and we're continuing with middle and elementary um, mass will continue to be required on all buses um, bus drivers and monitors so I'm just going to plead as a guy that helps Jeff with transportation um, please help us send a mask and ask kids to keep the mask just to be on the bus that's not a rule that we have um, jurisdiction over that's that's been given to us that's a gift that's been given to us um, but we we can't continue just to hand out masks left and right we've had two years to acquire masks um, I know we, we don't like it or not but uh, we masks are going quick um, on that piece of I'm just pleading to help the bus drivers and the transportation department please just send the mask ask them to gate or whatever throw it in their backpack because it's hard to give them one in the morning and one in the afternoon um, just for high school and now we're gonna add middle and elementary on Monday um, so I'm just asking pleading begging for that 
We need our um, administrators to help us with that. I and they have. They, we've yes. sent out masks, but they're just there's that could be a lot. So, yes, uh, thank we have you. About five five thousand people that ride the bus every day, to and from school. So yeah. where that where that becomes increasingly challenging is the midday runs, such as Arvin Center. Um, and you think about you know supporting our students, but you also think about supporting our drivers. Uh, the impact in terms of because everyone really just wants to do the very best that they can with a, a federal mandate and executive order that we're having to deal with. So it does create some challenges. And our parents who are here and maybe even watching, anything that they can do to help us just work with their students if they're riding a bus, we we don't have any uh, choice on uh, with our buses. Um, also, you. our quarantine, you know, it, it will change from, right now we've already changed quarantine protocol for high schools due to mask optional. We'll do the same thing in elementary and middle school on Monday when that um, happens as well. With that, though, test to stay is still available from 6 to 10 um, at the Oldham County Arts Center. Uh, and so that'll be Monday through Friday. It will not be open during um, breaks. Um, it will be open from 6 to 8 a.m. for teacher work days. So during Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, it will not be open um, on that piece. The, board, the current board approved COVID plan is on the website and will be updated as um, it continues to change and evolve. And I believe that is it for me. Thorough report. Um, any more questions uh, on the report itself, board members? Anything to add, superintendent? No. All right, thank you, Mr. Deves. So we are ready, Superintendent, for report number two, sir. Yeah, I'd like to invite Mr. Williams to come forward and, and update the report on the Oldham County Capacity Ordinance. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. Um, so as you all are aware, we do have a capacity ordinance which we work with the county planning and development. Approximately a year and a half, two years ago, they came to us and asked us to start looking at things a little bit differently. Um, and it has honestly taken about a year and a half to two years to work out at least the formulas for this to work for what they are now calling planned housing, the planned housing developments, PhDs? Planned use developments. So what we're talking about would be something that looks like Norton Commons. Okay, so you're talking potentially um, several thousand homes with a community, like a city center, essence, grocery store, that kind of thing that is potentially coming to Oldham County. So in looking at that, we looked at potentially incentivizing certain things. Um, there is only, I mean, we know that, that land in Oldham County is finite. There is only so much land to go around. So the things that we worked with planning and zoning to sort of incentivize were what are the what could be uses of the land that don't have a negative impact on school population. So the two things that we sort of came up with are green space. So in a neighborhood where it's developed that they have trails, they have you know other things that are used not just oh, well, we have a retention base and that's our green space. That doesn't count. So this is actually true green space where it's hiking trails, you know, bike trails, parks for families, those type of things. The benefit for us there is that uses that land, doesn't benefit us more than that, but it does not ever, is never going to have students produced from that land. Okay, the other thing that was looked at looking at this planned development sort of like Norton Commons is retail development built into the subdivision. So what we are incentivizing that in such a way because one, the land would never get used for houses to add population to the district, but we would also see an increase in the tax base from those retail facilities. So based on the board policy, um, it's an agreement between the district and planning commission um, how those numbers work. We've sort of worked those numbers out. This is just sort of an update for you all. I'm not trying to get into the weeds because 
those numbers became very finite and very specific on how it all calculates out. But we have worked it out. We are now in the process of looking at the administrative regulations for the district um, to continue our work with Planning Commission because I will tell you one thing that has been a great benefit for us as a district is at least having that input. Mm -hmm. I have been around long enough that prior to us having that input, we were growing from anywhere from 500 in a couple years, 600 and 700 students a year. Mm -hmm. um, this at least makes the growth manageable for us and we can ca I can help, that helps me calculate out when I come to you all and when I come to, you know, Mr. Bohannon and the superintendent and say, it's time. You know, I'm kind of still trying to hold that one off so that I can say, it's time, I'm retiring. Here, Mr. Davis, you get to do this. Oh. <laughs> just teasing. Yeah. Um, so, we, like I said, we just wanted to give you that update. Um, we are, um, I will actually be presenting again tomorrow morning at Planning Commission because they will have to approve it the way their, pol their side of the policy piece is changing. Um, and then it will go, beyond that, it will go to the uh, magistrates after that, the legislative bo actual legislative body for the county. So this sounds like it's very preliminary information and you may not have this, the actual information on housing units, et cetera. Well, the housing units themselves will depend on the subdivision. The calculation itself actually does incentivize, and I've worked that calculation out. Right. It actually does incentivize. So what it's doing is we're going from, historically we've always said you get X number of building permits per year. You know, initially and originally that started out as you got 40 building permits per year at time of approval from Planning Commission. So those building permits then could accumulate until you went to record plat. So if you got 40 a year and they, you get a new 40 every January, you know, you could have 80 building permits, you know, and still not have a house in the ground. Mm -hmm. It is now switched to, it's on a sliding scale, depending on the capacity at that campus that's served by that um, development. Anywhere from you can get 35 building permits per year all the way down to 15. The 15 is the guaranteed minimum. Um, but with this, what it will do is for the amount of the, the acreage of green space in your total, like the percentage of your green space, will give you a small incentive in increasing your number of building permits. And then it does the same thing, but it's a larger number to increase your number of building permits or units per year is actually how we're looking at it now. Um, units per year for commercial space built into that subdivision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions at this time, board members? Mr. Kehoe. So is there a timetable when this construction might start on this development? And, if the, and with those numbers, that development would have to take over 12 years to start to complete with 40 per year? Um, <laughs> So, the, Mr. Keogh, the way that will work is it will actually be a 20-year build-out for what I know of this subdivision that's coming. Um, and it will be more than 40 building permits per year because you're talking mixed use. You're talking not only single-family houses, you're talking condominiums, you're talking apartments because they have to have so many under roof to be able to attract that retail property. Um, to be able to fund, basically in essence, fund the retail property so that there's an incentive for the retailers to come to the to this development. To the area. But there is not a set start time for it at this point. It has not even gone through planning commission mm. in, in the way that it has to. It, it, it has different regulations and I am not the expert on the planning commission's regulations. I have tried to stay away from that. I have enough to figure out with ours and, and calculating all of that so but they are it is coming but it also would in potentially incentivize smaller subdivisions to at least add green space um, so that you're minimizing the number of sub you know houses coming out of a particular subdivision so if they get 40 this year and only build 15 they lose to the, they keep no that. they keep that 40 mm -hmm. and it's now actually 35 to 15 depending on 
they and it doesn't run, start at record they keep play. it for a few years. Hmm? They keep it for a couple, two or three years. That could hurt us. Well, Mr. Dawson, it doesn't now because they don't get it at time of approval. They get it now at what, what's called record plat. So they've already put the investment in to put the roads in, to put the sewers in, to run the electric to each lot. Once they go to record plant, that's when they can start selling lots and building houses. Mm -hmm. So they don't get that 35 until they've actually given planning commission the record plat. And then I get the record plat and I know how many I can calculate out from there. Yeah. Other questions? All right, good discussion. Thank you, Mr. Williams. You're welcome. And just share with the board, appreciate Mr. Williams, thank you, and appreciate his uh, his work with the Planning Commission. We have a, a really good uh, relationship and partnership, mm -hmm. and they uh, came to us and we discussed this, this uh, what will be a, a big project and have a terrific uh, impact on our community uh, planning forward, so just appreciate his work. Yes. Thank you. And we are ready for Superintendent Report number three, sir. Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, invite our uh, guests here for come forward and give the uh, auditor's report. Welcome, Daniel. Would you um, reintroduce yourself, please, sure. to everybody? My name is Daniel DeMonte. I'm an assurance manager with Barnes Denig and Company, and we are your auditors for the district. Excellent. Um, Thank you. Yeah. In front of you, you'll have uh, the actual audited financial statements. Uh, but I'm going to go through the uh, PowerPoint presentation um, that hits all the highlights and some required communications. So obviously we are uh, pleased to be of service to the district and hope to continue our relationship in, in years to come. We are engaged to perform an audit of the financial statements ending June 30th, 2021, uh, and also to complete a, a single audit compliance of our major federal programs. Some uh, required communications uh, distinguishing auditor and management responsibilities. Um, the financial statements are the responsibility of the district. Uh, we as auditors perform our audit uh, on a risk-based approach. Um, so we provide um, reasonable but not absolute assurance. If we were to provide absolute assurance, we would have to look at every invoice, every transaction, every payroll report, and that would just not be efficient with our time or the district's time. So uh, we kind of determine what areas are the riskiest. We perform our tests in those areas, and um, we get uh, reasonable assurance in, in that uh, section. Uh, internal controls are the responsibility of management. We do consider internal controls within the audit. We don't provide any assurance over those, but we do get an understanding of them. Um, our audit of the financial statements does not relieve your management of your responsibilities. <laughs> And uh, there's other uh, responsibilities that are uh, broken out in the engagement letter that, uh, that was uh, signed by both the district and us. So in the executive summary here, we have uh, that we issued an unmodified or clean opinion on both the financial statements and the major federal program, uh, which is the best opinion you can get for the audit. Uh, we received excellent cooperation from Stephanie and, and her staff throughout uh, the audit. Um, there were no disagreements or difficulties encountered during the audit and then no consultations with other independent accountants. Significant accounting policies you can find in the actual audited financial statements in note one. Um, there were no new accounting policies adopted in the current year. Um, so everything in there should be pretty similar as it was last year. Uh, internal accounting estimates that are provided to us are the depreciable lives of capital assets. Uh, we're happy to report that there were no internal control matters. Uh, if there were, we would report them to you. And also, we are, we are not aware of any matters related to fraud or legal acts, or we would also report those to you. And, and other written communication can be found in our management representation letter. And then last thing on this slide is that there are no significant audit adjustments um, due to materiality levels, meaning that our numbers in the financial statements match those of the district, so there are no differences. So next, uh, I'm going to just kind of go through some slides that show some trends and historical data of the district. Um, we have a bar graph here of the statement of net position district-wide. Um, 
honestly pretty similar for the past couple of years. Uh, a little bit of fluctuation <coughs> in uh, cash this year um, uh, and, and assets, I'm sorry, assets and deferred outflows increasing in the current year, and that is to do with the positive change in net position um, in, um, which relates to revenues exceeding expenditures in, in the past fiscal year. And we can look a little bit more into that in the next couple slides. But um, the next slide is district-wide net position analysis, where we break out the different um, categories of net position, investment in capital assets. This is obviously your buildings, vehicles, equipment for the district. Um, and as you guys do renovations, roof replacements, you know, anything like that, you know, that that's going to increase. Uh, restricted net position uh, involves your capital projects, future capital projects, as well as district activity funds and school activity funds. And then your unrestricted, um, which, <coughs> excuse me, which you can see is negative there, includes the uh, net pension liability and net um, OPEB liability that all districts in the state are required to record. Um, so I know that looks a little funny, but uh, it's, it's not uncommon to see throughout the state. So next we have revenues over expenditures uh, district-wide, and you can see that uh, for the past three years, the district has maintained revenues over expenditures. Um, even last year, 2020, with the pandemic uh, ongoing and this year. Um, so that's good. The increases in revenues were mainly related to uh, increase in operating grants. And the decrease in expenditures were um, decreases in business type activities, so food service and, and daycare activities. Next slide we have is balance sheet trends uh, for the general fund specifically. Um, again, we see a little bit of an increase in the assets, mainly due to increase in cash. And that is also directly related to revenues exceeding expenditures within the general fund. And then the next slide, we have revenues over expenses for the general fund, where you can see that uh, last year we had uh, a spike in, in expenses for the year, um, but with revenues steadily increasing and uh, expenses decreasing in 2021, uh, revenues were able to uh, exceed the expenses. Um, increase in taxes and, and other local sources, which can include bus rentals or tuition or just general reimbursements for the district. And then uh, there was a decrease in district administration and business support services expenditures. Uh, I won't go too much in depth on the next couple slides, just for your information. So your general property tax, you could see that that has been increasing over the past couple years. The um, general fund revenues by source, so we have taxes overall, which includes that general property tax. The uh, state revenues um, with the uh, inclusion of on behalf payments from the state and then excluding that piece so you can see that impact that of those revenues. Um, uh, and then uh, down below we have earnings on investments, federal funds for the general fund and other funds, uh, other revenues for the general fund which include uh, contributions, reimbursements, tuition uh, and revenue in lieu of taxes. Last slide here is revenues over expenses for food service. Um, you can see that that decrease in expenses that I was talking about in the food service activity is there, um, mainly due to uh, less spending in contract services and, and material and supplies. Um, and then lunch room sales was also uh, decreased in 2021. I will say, too, that this uh, slide includes expenses that um, are related to the pension uh, liability and OPEB liability that are obviously non-cash, so the expenses are a little bit inflated. Um, but that, that's how we have to record them on the food service fund and in the audited financial statements. So with that, that's all I had, um, but I'm open to any questions or comments. Let me ask board members. Thank you, Mr. DeMonte. Board members, do you have questions at this time? I'd like to have more time to review it. Yes. 
So we discussed, that's uh, the reason we tabled the action item. Um, we discussed with Mr. DeMonte and Ms. Anderson um, tabling our action item to give board members, the report is actually this document, and um, to give board members uh, more time to review the report and get your questions answered before we um, take action. Anything to add, Super? No, I, I, we can uh, revisit uh, for in, in the month of December uh, for possible action for the uh, board to approve. Mr. DeMonte, just thank you for being here. I'm sorry I didn't get down to a chance to say hello to you myself, so thanks for being here. It's all right. Thank you. We appreciate the report and all the uh, work that um, you did and your team did um, to, to accomplish our audit. It's really basically great news for our schools and for our uh, employees. So we, we really greatly appreciate this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. All right, Superintendent, we are ready for, oh, oh, I got to get to the agenda. Public expression. We are ready for public expression. Mr. Williams, are you here? 19. All right, we have 19 persons wishing to address the board. Mr. Dodson, would you read our policy governing public expression, sir? The board will designate a person, a portion of the meeting to hear public comment regarding areas under the board's jurisdiction. Persons wishing to speak shall sign in with the register and review the policy on making public comment. The board chair, chairperson or designee will read allow the public expression guidelines. Speakers should register by signing the sign-in sheet upon their arrival to the meeting. The board will call upon speakers in order of which they signed in. Speakers shall not exceed the time limit allotted by the board. The board will allot time based on the number of individuals registered to speak. What would the be? Pleasure of the board. Three. 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 Oh, three minutes? Three all right, all right. We'll we'll uh, limit our time again to three minutes, which for approximately twenty speakers, um, still uh, will put us at about an hour for public expression. Thank you. Public criticism of individual staff members and individual board members is prohibited. Concerns about individual staff performance should be addressed with the staff member directly, or his or her immediate supervisor or board chairperson, respectively. And at this time, uh, having just read our policy, Mr. Dodson, I am going to give the audience and board members a five-minute break since public expression oh, one more sentence to will run um, a good length of time. Finish your policy, Mr. Dodson. <laughs> so I was trying to control me. Yes, I am. Public expression is not a question and answer period. Any question expressed by the speaker will be noted with directives for appropriate administration to follow up. The board, however, reserves the right to respond when appropriate or necessary. Now you can have a five minute oh. <laughs> We're a great team. All right, we'll see you all back at about five.
Everybody ready? Thank you. Okay, let's begin public expression, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Dodson? This was requested, and uh, I see no problem with it. Three of you are going to speak together. Cassidy Stocker, Ty Stocker, and Harper Worth. Y'all may come up now. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. Okay. I will speak. I will speak, then Ty will speak, then Harper will speak. Prior to the last board meeting, my parents received a video from the school stating that if masks did change to optional, all other precautions would stay in place. That, however, is not proven to be the case, with two particularly dangerous changes. First, social distance measures are being eliminated at lunch. And second, the time of acceptable exposure is being arbitrarily lengthened from 15 to 30 minutes, despite this having no backing by any medical institution. This means that if an, inf an infected child can sit unmasked directly next to an immunocompromised child, or the sibling of an immunocompromised child, like my brother, my family, or any family really, does not have to be notified of exposure. Can you imagine how that makes me feel? That terrifies me. COVID may not scare other kids, but it could kill me. My brother could catch it and bring it home to me without even knowing we had it. All I'm asking for is one more month. One more month of masking until my brother's classmates have a chance to be fully vaccinated. One more month, please. I came here because I'm very concerned for my sister's health. I would be very upset if masks go optional because that puts my sister at risk, real risk. Numbers are going up faster than I can comprehend. To have my sister going would be heartbreaking. A lot of people believe that only kids with other health problems are at risk. Why does that even matter? Does my sister's life more than less than other healthy kids? Well, my sister is the one who keeps me going when things get tough and helps me through hard times. Her life is just as important as mine. So does that mean my life doesn't matter either? I know many people in here don't understand what it's like to have a family member or a friend with cancer. I'm not telling anybody to stop going to school or stop other activities. All I ask is that people wear a mask until kids my age get a chance to be fully vaccinated. I know a mask might annoy people, and I get it, they suck. They really do. But you know what sucks more? When that I might catch COVID from one of my classmates who hasn't had the time to fully vaccinate yet? Well, that I might bring that home to my sister. Masks are uncomfortable, but it's much more painful to think that my sister might not make it out of this pandemic alive. Hi, my name is Harper Worth, and I'm a fifth grade student in Kim at Kimmel Elementary. I'm here to ask you to continue to, to, mask, to make mask requirement until kids in elementary school have a chance to get fully vaccinated. I'm personally going to be very uncomfortable when the mask requirement ends. I have a three-year-old brother that has a heart defect. For me, it's terrifying that I could get COVID and give it to him, making him seriously sick. Masks help me feel way more safe, and they don't affect people in any negative way. Someone ran a marathon with a mask on. He could breathe just fine. I'm sure kids will be perfectly fine to wear, ma to wear a mask at school for a little longer. Thank you for your time, and please take my opinion into consideration. Thank you all. Next speaker is Shannon Stocker. Sorry, old eyes. So uh, a bit ago, Mr. Deez, I believe it was, stood up and said that um, Mr. Davis and 
Baptist Health could not give exact numbers on that 78%. I can because I have a study here from the New England Journal of Medicine that came out less than a month ago that's very new regarding children ages 12 to 18 and the efficacy of vaccines. In those children in that age group, the vaccine right now is proven to be 59% effective. It's actually proven to be slightly less effective if they're exposed to somebody who's symptomatic. That is 14 to 20 days after the first shot. I know a lot of kids who just got their first shot last week. I know a lot of kids that are just getting their first shots this week. I'm still seeing a lot of pictures of brand new band-aids. Efficacy does not go above that 78% mark until 7 to 21 days after the second shot when it shoots up to 90% efficacy. We cannot say how effective the vaccine is in younger children because to date that information does not exist. There were only 3,000 kids in the COVID study and I know about it because my son was one of them. We will not have that data until seven months after this first wave of vaccines has been done. The second point that I wanted to talk about is that I began tracking school data this past Tuesday when we had 49 active COVID cases and 108 people in quarantine because I noticed the numbers going up. I didn't want to come up here and make you guys listen to me one more time. Any more than you want me to be standing here talking to me one more time. But by Friday, we had 66 active cases and 174 people in quarantine. When I ran calculations, the elementary students represented 42% of the student body population, but they accounted for 61% of our active COVID cases. On the other hand, high school kids who can get vaccinated and have had time for those vaccines to take full effect make up for 33% of the population, yet they have only 19% of the COVID cases. Clearly, we have a problem in our elementary schools where children have not yet had the opportunity to get that second vaccine, let alone to have it take effect. And clearly, vaccines do make a difference when they are given time. Real quick side note, before this meeting, I spent six to eight hours researching what the experts recommend and the conclusions that they've reached because I don't ever want to get up here and say anything that's untrue. I don't ever want to email or post anything that's untrue. And I do not expect you, regardless, to heed my advice. But likewise, I don't expect you to heed the advice of any other parents, any nameless physicians, any outlying mental doctors who may have an agenda. Time's up. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Kristen Worthen. Good evening. Understanding the pressure of the district is under to end the masking requirement, many of the pro-masking families propose a compromise. Rather than waiting until children of all ages had had the opportunity to become fully vaccinated, we ask the district, just wait, please, until the elementary age children have had a chance to be fully vaccinated. That will be mid-December at the earliest. You compromised or compromise. <laughs> you did so based on incorrect data and false logic. By doing so, you're putting my family and others like mine at risk. Dr. Grant Paulson is a Cincinnati children's doctor who co-authored one of the studies with the clinical trial data relied on by the CDC and FDA in approving the Pfizer 11 vaccine. He stated just last week, there is no data yet on the efficacy of just the first COVID vaccine for kids. Given the vast difference in dosing, it's a logical fallacy to conclude that any data on the efficacy of just one dose in adults applies to children. I've heard claims that the board has consulted with pediatricians in making the decision to end the masking requirement next week. But I'm here to challenge that claim and would welcome the disclosure from the district of the medical professional supporting the November 29th date. We've made a decision to appease the masses no matter what the outcome is for disabled and vulnerable children that you are responsible for. We've shared our stories and we've given you solid data and have begged you to think about the vulnerable in your decision making. Some of you have listened and we thank you. 
Some of you have not. I ask you to think about what the impact is to angry parents if their children have to wear a mask for a few extra weeks versus what the impact is to my family if my medically fragile child catches COVID once the masks are off. Thank you. Jenny Terulo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yes, you're fine. I just want to address three misconceptions. First, many people have been told that local medical professionals have recommended the move to optional masking at this time, but no one has yet been willing to put a name behind that recommendation. The reason we've been given for this is that people don't want to be targeted, but you could just as easily reverse that argument and say people who support a mask mandate don't want to be targeted either. No one wants to be targeted, but then the scientific community at large supports a singular viewpoint that cannot and should not be ignored. Anyone can find an outlier or two to support their opinion. Because of this, we've printed pages from the websites of Norton Children's, Baptist East Children's, the top 10 children's hospitals in the United States, including Boston, Cincinnati, Texas, Stanford, and, and the CDC. All of them, ex without exception, still recommend universal masking in our schools when the county is in red, as ours is once again. Secondly, there is a misconception that asthma is not a comorbidity for COVID. Because of that, only 30 families in Oldham County are considered medically fragile, and mine is not one of them. But according to your physician, my son is more vulnerable per the CDC's website, conditions like congenital heart disease, obesity, diabetes, asthma, and sickle cell disease can all lead children to the increased risk for severe illness from COVID. I've also attached a highlighted copy of that page from the website. Finally, I wanted to address a wide misconception that COVID itself provides better immunity than the vaccine. This study, published less than a month ago by the CDC, confirms that yes, prior infection does provide some immunity against future illness. But the vaccines, on the other hand, are around five times more effective at preventing hospitalizations than prior infection. Please protect kids like mine. Please reinstate the mask mandate just until we can get our kids fully vaccinated. I'll leave this for you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Amanda Colasso. Good evening. I have three children in the district. I'm here today asking that you continue the mask mandate just a little bit longer. We are fairly new to the district. We PCS'd across the country during the pandemic, all while taking precautions to ensure our children's safety. We have continued to take these precautions and it has worked. What a blessing it was to get our older two children vaccinated. However, we have a child who was too young for vaccination until recently. He also has a condition that affects his red blood cells called alpha thalassemia trait. He is not medically fragile, but it is something that we consider every time we leave our house. We, ha we are not on the list of immunocompromised families and we know many families who are dealing with other pre-existing conditions, but these things may not fare well with COVID. We would love the opportunity for our youngest son to be able to get vaccinated like our older, older two children. He will not be considered protected until two weeks after his second dose. This is all according to our pediatrician. Because of the spacing of the vaccinations, he will not be safe at the current pro date projected to make masks optional. We are currently again in red in our county. We have many families planning on gathering for the Thanksgiving holiday and then coming straight into school without masks being required. How can I, as a parent, with the full responsibility of my child's health, agree to send him at this level of risk, especially when our pediatrician recommends against it? I understand many do not want to vaccinate their children and that is their choice, but my husband and I desperately want the opportunity to vaccinate our child without any unnecessary risk before I get. Thank you. Lauren Housel. Lauren Housel. There she comes.
Good afternoon, Dr. Radford and board members. Good afternoon. Oh, all right. My name is Lauren Halseal, and I am the parent of a medically fragile child in the highly structured academic classroom at OCMS. I believe Oldham County is the best place for my child, which is why I pay tuition for my daughter to attend the school in this district. I'm also a special education teacher at OCMS and the department head. I am blessed to be surrounded by brilliant educators and supported by an amazing administration team. However, there are things happening that are beyond the control of our administration, uh, administrators. Sorry. Speaking, um, speaking from a professional and a parental perspective, the highly structured classrooms in our district are reeling from staffing shortages and everyone is suffering the effect. Not only do we have unfilled positions left from the previous year, we are losing current teachers and aides almost weekly. According to Mr. Gravis' report, our district has seven open ECS teaching positions and 19 open ECS aid positions. The students in the highly structured classrooms are our most vulnerable, our most fragile, and our most challenging. The highly structured staff members are unsung heroes. They show up every day and spend their time providing medical care, managing volatile behaviors, and keeping the students safe. We have multiple students that require two adults for toileting, students who need small groups for academic and social goal meeting. Adults are needed to implement behavior plans and to ensure the safety of the students. Aides often get bit, scratched, hit, screamed at. They have feces thrown at them, all for less than they can make at a fast food restaurant. They also are unable to work 40 hours a week because of district restrictions. Office aides and other support staff without supervision duties are allowed to work 40 full hours a week. But our aides are capped at 32. Many of them bring home less than $200 a week. They stay because they love the children, but the mental and physical toll is becoming too much to handle. Aides are required to clock in and out regardless of student coverage needs. This hog ties our teachers, making for a lose-lose situation. We are pulling principals, counselors, and teachers to assist when they can, taking of resources away from the rest of our school. If education is truly our goal, it cannot happen without adequate help. The board made a successful incentive for substitute teachers earlier this year. I'm asking you to consider implementing a similar approach to address this issue. It is imperative that we make a district-wide priority. We cannot sustain these classrooms without swift and deliberate action. Please main, help us maintain a strong and equitable district by supporting all of our students and the staff members that love them. Please pay them what they're worth. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren, I have no doubt that you are one of our finest district teachers, and we have the utmost respect for our teachers and aides in our highly structured classrooms. Thank you for making this point with us. Lindsay Tickner. Good evening. It's so nice to see all your faces. Um, as you know, many of us tonight are wearing purple in honor of Lily Fairfield, and I can speak, I'm certain, for everyone in the audience, we are just heartbroken for her and uh, her family and the loss that they're going through. Um, I have two things to discuss with you. Number one, the VAX clinics at our schools. I, as a parent, as a taxpayer, I do not think this is a good use of our buildings. Um, you're all up here boasting about the numbers and how accessible it is to get these kids vaccinated. Keep in mind, this is a study that has no long-term research, none. And we're putting our kids at risk. Um, parents can do that if they choose, but I think it would weigh heavily on you if something happened. As all of you have said, the safety of our students is your top priority, and you're, you're willing to, to put a kid in potential danger for something that we have no long-term studies on. So I'll just say that. Um, also, my second thing, please stop discriminating, but discriminating against our students by requiring the unvaccinated to quarantine and the vaccinated not to quarantine. These vaccines have proven, Dr. Fauci has admitted, that they do not work long term. You've asked about the immunity. Long, how long does it take to get full immunity? You can't. Fauci's admitted that. 
the CDC admits that people who are vaccinated still catch it, still spread it. And yet our school policy is written in such a way that a kid who chooses not to get vaccinated, whose parents choose not to put him through a vaccination, are still discriminated against. They still have to quarantine and a vaccinated kid who can still catch it doesn't have to. I think that's unnecessary. You all need to stop discriminating against our kids. And finally, as you guys are looking into considering, as the numbers are going up, and as Ms. Stalker mentioned, the elementary school numbers have gone through the roof. On November 8th, when you guys implemented mask optional for the high school and proposed November 29th to lift for everybody, there were only seven cases in nine elementary schools. We're at 38 today. They were in masks. So clearly that's not working. And I would also submit it's possible that some of those who are getting vaccinated are also getting sick from it. I don't know, just saying, putting two and two together. One thing about our medically fragile students that I wanna mention as well, the policy was set for kids who are exempt from wearing masks at the beginning, that they had to sit six feet away from everybody. They were treated differently. I would say we, we offer this up to our medically fragile students. If they have to stay masked, we can put them in a situation in the classroom to protect them if other kids are not unmasked. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Beth Lamprey. Okay, it's separate to preach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hope I didn't damage your last name too bad. Sorry, I married a German and you gave me that rotten name. Um, so I'm here tonight. Um, as you guys know, I'm a former teacher. I left this district. We pulled our kids out. Um, and, but I'm here tonight to speak because, and the reason I keep coming to these is because I have a lot of former students in this district that are still in these schools, and I am speaking for them. Um, and so in 2017, our daughter was permanently injured by a vaccine, and in doing research, we discovered the National Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, which makes all vaccine manufacturers uh, not liable for any, any injury or death. So you can be injured or die from a vaccine, and you cannot sue them at all. Okay, Ronald Reagan signed that in 1986. So uh, when our daughter was, uh, you know, injured, uh, we discovered we can't do anything about it. And it was traced back to the polysorbate 80 that is in all vaccines. It renders uh, girls 14, um, ages 14 and up with permanent ovarian failure. Okay? So uh, in that um, battle for the last five years, we have learned a lot about vaccines. And I was very um, big on vaccinating my children and myself as a teacher prior to this injury. And in doing my research, I have found many things. One is that, as many people have stated, um, there were no human clinical trials done on the COVID-19 vaccine. None. The reason none were done is because when we did the animal trial, the animals died. They were not permitted to continue with a human trial. So when you talk about safety and efficacy, and the CDC says it on the website, look on the CDC's website. There is no raw data. We have no raw data on the safety and efficacy of it. They will not let us have access to their studies. There, is, there were no human clinical trials. All of you that are getting vaccinated now, you are the clinical trial, okay? And the reason they keep saying you need to wait until we have data, because you're the data. Right? It's just unconsented, right? You didn't consent to be in a human trial, but you are. So we did find that um, in CV, the CDC, um, which is, is a list, of, a site that I use for a lot of stuff, uh, the CDC actually stated on their site that the COVID-19 vaccine does not prevent spread or infection of COVID. They state it. All right? You can read that all kinds of information on the CDC site. They will tell you it does not stop the spread of it. It does not prevent the infection of it. So when you get the vaccine, you are not protected from COVID. So if you want to know where some of these COVID cases are coming from, they're coming from the vaccinated because they can be sick. My next door neighbor is sick. He got vaccinated and within two days he had COVID. They absolutely told him that it was a possible outbreak from his vaccine. His doctor told him that. So I have multiple members right now sick with COVID from their shot. So the other thing that the CDC reports is there have been 894,145 adverse effects from the COVID-19 vaccine. 10% of the adverse effects died within 24 hours of the shot. Your time's up. Okay, thank you.
Lauren Bearden. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just want to take a moment and a breath and say thank you all for serving. Thanks for being here. And I hope we're all united in this room, at least in wishing you and all of us a safe and healthy holiday. So, yeah. Um, I'm a parent. I have a six-year-old first grader at Kenwood. And I'm just making a simple request. I would love to continue the required mask mandate in elementary schools just through winter break. That gives us a per like a perfect built-in buffer. We have two weeks um, break right there to give our younger kids plenty of time to get their second shot and then be three weeks out from their second shot. I know with my child particularly, um, his second shot is December 4th, so that puts him right at the start of winter break. Um, kids who are just getting it now or getting their first dose at the vaccine clinics at the schools, that gives them ample time too. So um, that's really my only request. Thank you again so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Bearden. Is it Julie Penner? Did I get it right? You did. It used to be far height, so that was always much worse. Uh, it was a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity for us to speak. I know that it just helps to feel heard, so I really appreciate that. Um, I had a bunch of statistics here, but they've already been stated, so all I'm really going to say is that my daughter was vaccinated about a week and a half ago. She'll get her second vaccination on the 4th. And I would just like you to extend the, the mandate. Um, my daughter, <laughs> ever since she was so little, I have said to her when she's afraid, don't worry, my job is to keep you safe. So much so that when she's afraid now, I say, don't worry. And she says, I know, your job is to keep me safe. So I'm asking you to help me with that. Thank you. Agnieszka Summit then? Summerlin, sorry. I get the first name right? Did I get the first name right? Yes, very good. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking like <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so my name is Agnieszka Summerlin, and uh, my son graduated from the Oldham High School, uh, Oldham uh, County Schools, Kenwood, or uh, South Oldham Middle and um, South Oldham High School. and. A um, couple years ago, now I'm, uh, I'm still a resident and a taxpayer. That's why I feel like I still have the right to be here because 65% uh, of my uh, property tax goes to school, not to mention electric bill and all this other stuff. So anyway, I'm also a legal immigrant from Poland. I grew up in communism before Poland threw off the chains of tyranny of that oppressive system. Mm -hmm. Having experienced living without freedom, I'm here to support and stand up for the freedom. In this case today, it's the freedom for parents to choose to mask their children or not, to um, have the choice to weigh the risks for their children and their families um, themselves and not allow the government to be doing that. Um, if you take your freedoms for granted and are willing to give it up little by little in different ways, different aspects, different times, and allow the government agencies to dictate you different aspects of your life, in this case, uh, medical, um, and you get some false sense of security, you will welcome what you will wake up one day in the system and I was born to. I just want to caution everybody because as I've been looking, uh, watching things and watching what's been happening, um, the last several years and on TV and all the experts, you know, some people say, and I tend to agree more and more with this, that there's no science, only scientists. There's credible scientists, doctors, experts on both sides from all the different accredited universities and respected places that have these opposite points of view, it seems. Um, so where is really the science? if it's supposed to be objective. Um, how do you discredit some people and not others? So please keep in mind, and it has been shown time and time and again, that data can be manipulated. Statistics can be skewed, they can be taken out of context, um, they can say things one way or another, you know. I've heard things about, for example, ICU capacity, um, that it's 90% or 103%. Um, I heard a point of view saying that, well, we don't have enough nurses, so we can't have all the beds. We might have 100 beds available, 
But just like in a restaurant, if you don't have enough people to service those, i.e. nurses or in the restaurant uh, waiters, then they won't open these tables or these um, um, beds because you have to have a nurse to take care of somebody in that bed. And if they don't have it, then they can't fill that bed. So I don't know. Uh, but there's different ways. This is just an illustration how things can be presented that might not necessarily have all the information. Um, and I would also caution you, sorry, I'm just a little nervous, <laughs> um, about I'm just amazed how much people trust the government here. Um, because growing up in my system, you think this is not going to come to America. This is free country, and really everybody looks up to you guys, to, to this country, and I'm an American citizen by now. Ma'am, your time's up. Okay. All right. Yeah. Corey White. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Just like to take a couple of minutes to uh, reiterate. I also would like to request that masks be extended until just, um, I'm going to put a date on it, at two weeks after winter break. Uh, children have need a little bit more time to be fully vaccinated. The dates themselves plus two weeks. And with, in addition, with Thanksgiving and Christmas, people spend time with their families. They might be they might be contagious. So just to give two extra weeks to prevent the spread in schools, and then go to the go to the choice option that's been that's been stated before. So that's my first ask. My second uh, segment is just I'm I'm like another parent. Uh, I've shared with some of you in emails. We we've been it's kind of hit home for us. The, the medically at risk thing. We have a, a younger sibling of our student, a sibling who's unable to be vaccinated even now. is below the age group that's able to be vaccinated. So that's, that child of ours, uh, we found out, has a, a very low white blood cell issue. And we're seeing a specialist, but it's going to take a few weeks before our next appointment to establish a pattern to know what the issue is. Is it cancer? Was it a fluke from a, from a, a viral illness? We, we don't know yet. So until then, we're a little bit at a loss for what to do about sending our child to school when the masks are going to be made optional. And that child might bring home COVID to our, our one-year-old. That would be at risk. If he gets a fever, we have to go to the hospital. That's, that's where we're at at the moment. So it's a, it's a bit scary for us right now. And the idea of trying to quarantine children from one another when they love each other is, is a difficult thing for us. Finally, I would just ask that I know a lot of us like to, this helps a lot of us to feel heard. But at the end of the day, I hope you're considering only the opinion from the Board of Health. And from those, those experts and what they're saying and the, and the data they see just like we do, but they're a lot better qualified to interpret the data than we are. I'm an engineer. I'm, I have no medical background to interpret CDC data. I can see what, what, how it's written and I, can, I think I can do the best I can, but at the end of the day, I'm not trained in it and I can't make all the inter interpretations and all the context that needs to come with it. So please extend the mask requirement if you can uh, until after Christmas break just to give us that time and please only take the the opinion of the Board of Health, even maybe asking for a meeting for them to talk to you all about it, what they recommend and then go on from there. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Mr. You. White. I said thank oh, you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Dar Darcy Olswiski. I'm sorry. <laughs> Me? I'm bad. Could you just leave it at Darcy? <laughs> testing you with all these names. Yes, <laughs> he is. I'll you are. My best shot. <laughs> you did a good job. I'm Darcy Oshesky, um, and I have a first grader at Kenwood. Um, and really, I'm not going to take up a whole lot of your time, because um, honestly, I think everyone's covered everything that I would say. Um, I'm just here to add another voice to please extend the mask, um, at least until after Christmas. Um, my son, we took the first available appointment that we, that we could last last weekend um, and had to drive to Indiana to get that vaccine. Um, he's not due for his mother one for the next two weeks. And then after that, it'll be another two weeks before he's considered fully vaccinated, which puts us right at the very beginning of winter break. Um, so if you count the days um, coming back from Thanksgiving until winter break, that's only 15 extra days of in-person school. Um, we've been at this for three and a half months now wearing masks, so what's another 15 days to get us to that point um, and really be able to see what the trends are, what the numbers are doing, because um, the numbers are on a rise again. Um, so at least give us that time to be able to get our children protected that we choose to do that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Elliott. Welcome. 
want to reiterate, I'm pro-choice when it comes to mask, um, not anti-mask, just choice. Um, I, it hurts my heart tonight to, to hear all the fear um, coming from people. Uh, peer, fear is so powerful. It's such a powerful emotion. It, it brings anger. It brings, um, excuse me, brings uh, anger and hate in some cases. Um, I just, I, I encourage so many to have some faith. Where you find faith, where you have your faith is where you're going to find your calm and some peace with this. Um, that's just on the mass thing. I have one other little thing to address. Um, it's on the, the KIPP survey. Mm -hmm. Who approved that? Where did it come from? And whose business is it of the schools? Half, more than half of those questions that were on that survey. That's all I have on that one. Thank you. Bridget E. Um, good evening. Um, one of the things so many people keep saying is, let's give it a little more time. Let's give it a little more time for the vaccines to work. But what we found um, from the adults who've been vaccinated is it's not time that's needed, it's a booster. And then we're gonna have another booster. And I just don't see this cycle ending. You know, it's constantly another couple of weeks, another few weeks, and the kids are still masked. And uh, we did a, an online survey um, with parents, and there are so many kids who are saying that they're having severe headaches. And um, I think the masks are more than an inconvenience. Um, they're, they're causing kids' um, heart rates to go up, their blood pressure to go up. Um, we have no idea the long-term effects of the masks. And it just seems that when you're in doubt, you have to choose liberty, otherwise you're choosing tyranny, especially when you're talking about a blanket system of all children. You know, all children must be masked. And um, it's no surprise that the kids are getting these headaches because they're, they're being forced to breathe their bodily waste and the bacteria that's grown on the masks. And I mentioned before there was a study that shows that the masks act like nebulizers and they're actually spraying this bacteria into each other's faces when they speak. It's really a very dirty, disgusting thing. And you know, they touch it, they touch the bacteria on the mask, they touch their eyes. And I, I know that we're concerned about sickness, but this is, a form of sickness. And when we look historically um, in the Spanish flu, it's even admitted by Dr. Fauci that most of the people died in the Spanish flu from bacterial pneumonia. It was a bacteria. So bacteria is very dangerous. And we may not even understand yet all the things that are happening to children because of these masks. Because we're saying, listen to the doctors. Well, the doctors that we see on mainstream media are all the ones who are for the vaccines, who are for the masks. There are many doctors who are not for it, but they're not allowed to speak freely. And that is a big concern. We have to ask why. Why are we not hearing from those experts? So I just say that we are free men and women. Our children are free. It's time we stand up and start acting like the free people we are, especially our elected officials. Thank you. Kevin Soltar. Karen. Karen. Looked like Kevin. I'm sorry. That R looks like a V. I'm sorry. Oh, this might be Mr. Dodson's last public expression to <laughs> manage. <laughs> it's Karin's old towel. Okay, Karin, we got Karin. cut him a little slack. That's uh, okay. I ever, everybody gets it wrong. Thank you. So everybody's really well prepared. I am. I'm really not, but um, I do want to say that uh, if we really want to get out of the mass and all of that, the best fastest solution is for everybody to vaccinate. Uh, until we get vaccinated, we've got to keep wearing these things because it's a, it, we're in a pandemic. And all of the hospitals in our region are all for masks for that reason. So the medical communities are actually really in agreement on this. Uh, I'd like to take my mask off, but you know, I can do it. And um, it's the best way to keep each other safe until we get enough people to reach herd immunity. 
You know, there was a, I don't know what state it was in, but it was somewhere in the East Coast where they have a, a vaccination rate among the population, high 80s or maybe somewhere in the 90s, but it's high, it's at least high 80s. In that state, they decided recently to take a school district and not wear masks because they have such a high vaccination rate. So they did it and it was really successful. Kids were thrilled to not wear a mask, but people weren't getting sick because they had such a high vaccination rate. So that's the really only way we're gonna get out of this is, uh, and find out how often we might need to be vaccinated. Um, but as far as leadership goes, uh, I worked at Fort Knox in the military and where leadership is an important thing. And one thing I've learned is <clears throat> part of really good leadership is not just telling everybody what to do, but the question we all have is who's in charge? Who's the protector? Really, not so much in charge. Who's the protector and who's protected? And when leaders are seen, like in the military, as protectors, which is true for all of us if you think about any job you had. It's good for everybody else. You feel better if you feel like the leader is a protector. And we need you, and I hear a lot of parents saying they'd like to feel like their kids are protected, and that's kind of your job for students is to help keep everybody safe. And masks do work, so uh, I think it's, you gotta keep doing it as long as we stay in the red and the numbers are high and people aren't vaccinated enough. You know, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karn. Now, I know I'll get this last name right, Lisa Paris. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for letting us speak. As always, we appreciate that greatly. Um, I just want to make a couple quick reminders. PubMed is a great site. I've been on it for years, and you can find out a lot of information there if you're looking for information. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up is that this vaccination is like the, the hero of the universe and is going to save everybody, and nobody's going to have to be sick anymore, and this is a COVID virus like a common cold, and I've had many common colds in my life. We are gonna have COVID, 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 COVID all the time from here on out throughout humanity, just like we've had it for the last 43,000 years. So we can't get rid of it. It is a cold virus. What we can do is build up an immunity to it, and we can do it our own way. For me and my family, we are choosing to catch COVID and get immune to it as much as we can, and then the next time, catch it again and get immune to it. And some people wanna get vaccinated, that's great. And then they will have immunity for however long they have it. And then who knows what's gonna happen with other fallout that they aren't aware of yet with the vaccines. And I don't wanna go into those details because some of them are grisly, okay? But when it comes to masking our kids, I've got two asthmatic kids. One of them recovered beautifully from COVID. He was sick for less than a week and he was fine, and now he's coughing up blood, okay? He's had a rash on his face and his chest and his arms that oozes a clear liquid. We've given him MRSA medicine, we've given him antivirals, antibacterials, the doctors, we don't know what it is, okay? He's a perfectly healthy kid. I don't know what he's got. He's got headaches so bad he can barely think for three straight weeks and his hair is falling out. So when she said bacteria are dangerous, they're dangerous, they're dangerous. And I don't wanna think that it was masking that's caused this, but there's not really anything different in his life. We have the same dogs, the same animals, same family members. The only thing different in his life is the mask. So please stand tall on your decision. You know, we all have our crosses to bear. We all have burdens, right? And God will help us with all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That is it. Is there anybody else wishing to address the board that did not have an opportunity to sign in? Oh, my administrators are looking at me like I'm going to kill you, Joyce. We're almost there. Ah, okay. 
please. <laughs> what is your name? Uh, Kelly Nowak. Kelly um, what? Nowak. Polish. <laughs> Um, I, I had contacted the school. My children go to Crestwood Elementary. I have two sons. One has asthma, but it's the kind of asthma where we went to the hospital in emergency, like in an ambulance. We weren't able to stabilize him. He was in first grade. He almost died, and that was from asthma. I mean, I can't imagine what COVID would do. Could you raise the mic up a little oh, bit? Oh, sorry. I can't imagine what COVID would do. If my little boy at five years old almost died from an asthma attack. So my other son, who they both have autism, they're high function, so you wouldn't know it, but um, except for, you know, they're, they interact with kids a little differently. But he ended up getting um, viral pneumonia when he was five years old. We were in Children's Hospital for a week. He almost died. The moment when someone tells you that your child is going to die um, when in a time where they shouldn't. It, it never even occurred to me that that was even a possibility. And the sad thing is, I have a master's in transplantation immunology. I did research for five years in infectious diseases. I changed my career for my kids. I became a special education teacher. And that's what I do now. It's all because I care, and it doesn't hurt other kids. But giving everybody a chance, that doesn't hurt anybody. And I would just ask that you would extend it until the data comes out, because the last thing we want is a child to die, and it happens. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. I think now we are concluded for public expression. Thank you, everybody. We are ready for action item I, sir. I recommend uh, the, uh, the, sorry, I recommend the board consider approval of the early graduation hardship request as presented in your packet. Yes, sir. And we had four requests, I think, this, this yes. uh, month. Questions or comments? So your recommendation again, sir? Yes, just recommend to approve. Motion to approve, please. Made by Ms. Hundley, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor, and that's 5-0. Superintendent, action item K, sir? Yes, consider approval of Stockyard's investment options as presented. We heard that uh, report um, before, and we have uh, additional information on that. Are there any questions or comments? So your recommendation, sir? Yeah, recommend to approve. Motion to approve. Made by Mr. Kehoe, seconded by Ms. Nykirk. All those in favor, that's 5-0. And we have one more action item L, sir. Yeah, that's consider approval of COVID update mitigation strategy for individual schools. Um, Ms. Easton, if you could pull up the screen. Yeah. So if the board will allow me, I'd like to review a, 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 a couple of items. Please do. So district level decisions, um, superintendent, myself, and our, our COVID committee uh, work with our health professionals and we continue to analyze data uh, on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, we may recommend to the Board of Education to implement masking district-wide to mitigate spread by, an by analyzing and reviewing the following factors. Kentucky State Positivity Rate, Oldham County Incident Rate, School Cases District-wide, that's on a five-day average, and ICU Capacity in Use, and that's District 3 or Region 3, and that's our area. This, uh, these data points are uh, recommended from our health professionals. In addition, I would also just add that it's, all of this information is on our website, and we watch what happens inside of each school as, er, as presented earlier. Other contributing factors, family connection of positive cases, school exposure of positive cases, large events, suspected school transmission, and we monitor vaccination rates. We don't require vaccination rates. We monitor vaccination rates that is reported uh, within our county for um, our population. So in terms of how we would make decisions, the next slide, please, Ms. Easton. 
as you as you saw earlier presented earlier tonight this gives if i would draw the board's attention to august the week of august 23rd that's the first week of this school year that we had data reported on all, all five of those data points that would be an indication of what we would want to avoid and do everything we could to avoid that so as you see the state positivity rate was at 12 uh, just over 12 percent the incident rate was so was well above uh, the red area in terms of what's reported on a daily basis at 46.2 we had 15.6 just over 15.6 school cases on a five-day average and then the vaccination rate is something that we monitor ICU capacity at that time was not uh, has not had not peaked uh, as what we have seen recently but those are some indications of what we want to avoid um, I would just also indicate that uh, our board and myself have gotten lots of emails and requests to have a specific data point it is very challenging to do that to help make to, to make decisions because there are so many factors that go into that I compare that to making a, a decision about to cancel school for bad weather although these are not the same but there are so many factors that go into making that decision it's very very hard to, to do that so our community health uh, professionals have uh, given us um, really um, some indication as to what uh, what to look for to help us do that so that is just for review for our Board of Education um, next slide please miss miss Easton so school level decisions our board had asked me to, to come back uh, two weeks ago I had suggested that we make some uh, perhaps make school level decisions and the board said please uh, we visit and, and come back to us about how those decisions would be made so I'd just like to present to the board for uh, for discussion the superintendent and COVID committee would analyze the data within the school on a daily basis and they implement masking school-wide for up to two weeks based upon and reviewing and analyzing the following factors the number of positive cases by school I would draw your attention to earlier you saw Mr. Dees present about the number of positive cases that we have per school based upon uh, student population per school the family connection of positive cases I'll give you an example um, I'm, as an example we had uh, a few one or two weeks ago we had 10 positive cases within the district five of those positive cases resulted were tied back to through um, contact tracing two households that impacted two schools so I think there's so many so many factors that go into how you how we make decisions and certainly we always want to be transparent in uh, what those what those um, things look like school exposure of positive cases large events we had a um, a school that had a large number of positive cases show up uh, two weeks ago and kids and families were doing what kids and families do they had a sleepover at one particular house and those students became several of those students became very became positive and they all attended the same school so I think that's a, those are factors that help uh, uh, go into consideration uh, suspected school transmission and of course we monitor vaccination rates and that's uh, trying to uh, take the recommendations of our community health professionals so these will all be factors that we would and as you saw earlier tonight we, we can determine what's happening at the school level uh, based upon um, per school based upon number of cases and the percent of that student population and so relatively currently right now we do not have a high percentage of students that are positive within our schools uh, we are seeing an increase of positive cases that's happening within our community and compared to two or three weeks ago Miss Easton if you'll go back Miss Easton go back a couple of slides so such as I draw your attention to November the 8th we, had, we were averaging 2.8 cases uh, on a five-day average and 16.7 in the county and you can see the incident rate is increasing but we're seeing a, a more a higher increase in what's happening within our community versus what's happening in our schools thank you superintendent I'm going to ask board members um, to limit their questions to um, the information that's been presented at this time if you would well you may have other questions certainly but um, do you have questions at this time for the superintendent Mr. Kehoe Jane could you go to the next slide please superintendent you mentioned uh, factor number B um, I think you and I spoke before I, I feel that personally that the sports uh, within the schools also contribute to that and I didn't know if there's a way you could stick 
the sports um, aspect into that formula as well? So, our, um, Mr. Deves, you may want to sp uh, speak to that specifically, but we, what we have seen is what's happening in, inside of our classrooms during the school day, and as positive cases get reported, we're able to, that net uh, is able to be casted and catch those who are participating in sports. Certainly, um, we do not have a perfect system to be able to help us catch um, or determine all of those things because there are, once you get to the high school level, there's lots of uh, avenues that students can, can, can travel in terms of going from uh, the locker room to the car or going from, uh, now that we're getting into basketball season, going from the locker room to uh, exiting the building. Uh, so we do try very diligently to uh, try to monitor that. But that's how we have been reporting that. And so then our test to stay does allow us to be able to uh, identify students who may be asymptomatic, who don't have symptoms. Um, so we have, uh, Mr. Dees, I don't know if you yeah, want to ask just, you um, We did talk about that a little bit, Mr. Kehoe, and we kind of lumped that into school exposure because you can't just single out sports because we have band and choir and now drama's picking back up. Um, there's so many different activities um, within the school. We lump those. That would still be considered a school exposure if it happened at one of, at, during one of our sporting events with one of our teams. Now, if you want to go outside of maybe it's a travel team or something like that, then, I would, then we could look at that from either the family connection or the large event. Um, but just singling out sports with everything else going on in, element, in middle schools and high schools. Um, and then even at the elementary school, they could have a PTA or PTO event or something like that. And there could be some school exposure that way. So the reason I ask is earlier in the year, I guess uh, sometime in September, the football team experienced uh, a okay. pretty high rate of COVID. If you looked at the total number of players who were exposed, if you looked at the total number of players who exposed you. versus the school population, it was about 50% related back to the sports team. So I'm just saying, um, I, I, I can see where you're going with your data, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we, you know, suspend play for a few days on the sports team to help with those numbers. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out some answers there. Yeah, I think, um, I know last year and even this year, we've talked to coaches and ADs about if that does happen, um, there comes that, re that diminished return on. If you keep practice or keep playing, you could... Um, forfeit and so forth. KHSA has changed their rules on the forfeit rule. Um, it's not like it was last year, a win and a loss uh, on that piece of it. And I know it's not all about wins and losses, uh, but I think we could still actively pursue until you don't have enough to field a team that's competitive um, or to injure somebody. So, uh, but we could, you know, we, we've, we've, had, we've had cases, we didn't start, um, we didn't close down athletics beforehand until if it happened during the season, it was mostly for the season. We've had a few cases where we've had to close down for a week or so, but um, we haven't had any of those lately. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe, and thank you, Mr. Deves. Other questions, Mr. Dodson? I just got a comment. One <laughs> thing I like about this, it doesn't, if you have a set number, then if we get it, all the schools got a mask. This gives the option to go to individual schools, and like I said, if it's one large family event, that wouldn't necessarily mass at school because of where it came from. So you got options with this where if we just had, well, if it's 2% over everything, we're going to mask. That's why I like this pretty well. Thank you. Uh, yes, that, that um, really empowers our administrators, et cetera, to make an informed decision with all of the factors that play into this. So you're right. Other questions or comments? All right, Superintendent, your recommendation then, sir? You might need to read this, Superintendent. Yes, uh, I approve the, uh, I recommend the COVID mitigation strategy related to masking as outlined above and authorize and ask the board to authorize me to reinstate universal masking for up to two weeks on an individual school basis in order to prevent any type of outbreak. Thank you, sir. Madam Chair, may I make an amendment to that? You may. No. I have to look at my general counsel. We really need to take action on this recommendation. And then if you would like to bring forward another recommendation, you can do that, okay. Mr. Dodson. That'll work. Correct. 
Um, so uh, you heard the recommendation from the superintendent. Um, is there a motion to approve this recommendation made by Ms. Hundley, seconded by Mr. Kehoe? All those in favor? And that would be 4-0. No, but 5. 5-0. I voted for that. I'm, I'm yes. for this. All right, so there you go, Superintendent. Um, did you have another um, idea, Mr. Dotson? Yes. Based on what I've heard here tonight and through communications, I don't know if it's the right place, but I'd like to make a motion that we do not make mask optional until after Christmas, right at coming back from Christmas break for the middle and elementary schools. The first day back from Christmas break to allow for these students to get the shots and be fully vaccinated. All right, thank you, Mr. Dodson. I am rereading the motion that just passed the recommendation. Let me just entertain any additional discussion from board members. Is there any support, board members, for uh, moving in that direction? Ms. Nykirk. So I think that, that Mr. Dotson has an absolute heart for the kids, and that's absolutely apparent. Um, mm -hmm. We are, we have been striving to make sure that we're trying to make the best decisions. Um, and we know that there's opposition on both sides. We know that there's there's a um, there's going to be a level of contention no matter what decision is made. Um, please know that whatever decision is made is not on behalf of any particular um, one individual, but we have to make decisions based on the schools, and it's it is difficult. So please don't think that this is this has been a very easy decision or even that we even entertain anything like that, that it's, it's been very hard. Um, but I know Mr. Dotson and I know that he really wants to protect our, our kids um, mm -hmm. just like we all do. Um, and I think that, that he needs to be commended, you know, for just bringing that up because he does have a heart and a passion. Um, I know that we will, will do the best we can though to make that make a decision. I know we've already made a decision um, to have mask optional. So that really wasn't on the, on the docket for tonight. Um, and we wanted to have a mitigation plan in place for um, how to make school decisions. Um, and so with that said, I mean, I just wanted to give accolades to Mr. Dotson and just say we've all, we all feel that, uh, that tug at our heart when we know we have some me medically fragile children, both masked and unmasked, and they've, we've, we've had experiences with both. Um, and so I, I just wanted to just state that, that it's, this is a very difficult time for us, and please know that we don't take this decision or anything like this very lightly. Um, it's very difficult for all of us, I think. Well said, thank you, Ms. Nykirk. Anybody else want to add to this discussion? I um, completely agree with your remarks. And um, I also would like to say I've had some several conversations with some of the um, folks that we have heard from through emails. And while I um, am, am so empathetic and so respectful for all of the concerns that everybody has shared with us, I agree with Ms. Nykirk that we um, are struggling to make the right decision for the majority of our students. We um, identified November 29th with, um, as, a, as a date to go to mask option slash recommendation. And I, I feel as though we need to uphold that date. We approved it. But I do think that uh, we are also, by the action we just took, giving the superintendent and his COVID team the authority, if necessary, to make decisions based on individual schools and what's happening in individual classes. And that may be the additional level of protection that we can offer to certain families. And, um, and I know that we are all committed to watching that data on a daily basis. And um, 
I thank you, everybody, for your support and understanding. Mr. Dodson made a recommendation for a, um, a new action item. Is there a second to that? I do not want to walk away from the table. But thank you, Larry. All right, we're going to move ahead with the agenda, ladies and gentlemen. There are a couple of informational items. Board members, please review the monthly preschool report and the district energy report. And um, is anybody ready to read our um, reason for going into executive session? Have you got that, Ms. Nykirk? I do not. Mr. Kehoe, you got it ready? Is there a page? I have. All right, Mr. Dodson is going to read it. Um, our reasoning for going into executive session, please. At this time, we need a motion to go into executive session to discuss the following matters. Three litigation matters pertaining to student injuries, one special education matter, and employment claims matter. The board needs to go into an executive session pursuant to KRS 61.810. 1, M, 1 C to discuss litigation preparation, the public disclosure of which could jeopardize the board's position. All right, so that's uh, 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 the information regarding going into executive session. May I have a motion to do that, please? Made by Ms. Nykirk, seconded by Mr. Kehoe. All those in favor, and that's 5 0. So we will adjourn for now. Thank you, everybody. Oh, before I forget, it is Thanksgiving week, and we are blessed to be in this community.